Okay, it's rolling. So okay. go ahead. All right. So people have asked me, uh, who is Samantha S. Nivison, and uh, why am I doing a presentation on her? And it, this was an accident that I happened upon Samantha. I was at a downtown volunteers meeting, and we were talking about um, the ghost walk tour in October for Halloween. And somebody just happened to mention, well, maybe we should do that story about, um, about that place where all those babies are buried. So my, um, my antenna went ding, 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 ding. What, <laughs> what place, uh, what baby's buried? And this person really didn't know any more about it. So I started digging into it. That led to several months worth of investigation on the internet, going to May's Landing, all kinds of advent adventures, visiting the place where this all occurred. Um, and yes, a terrible tragedy happened in this town in, in 1884, and we're gonna talk about that. Um, and yes, many babies died. Um, but as important as that is the story of the lady who, uh, who built the sanitarium where these infants died. And she was an amazing, amazing woman. So I am going to spend the majority, really, of this discussion talking about Samantha S. Nivison, Dr. Nivison, and uh, we'll get to the tragedy as it, as it comes along. I'm going to follow my slides pretty carefully here, so if you would, uh, if you just want to read along, that, that's fine. Samantha was born in 1833 in Mecklenburg, New York, and I'll show you in just a minute New York State and where Mecklenburg is. Her father was a farmer, not particularly well-to-do, but he was able to raise 12 children, so obviously he did well enough. What's even more interesting is that six of the 12 children became doctors. Okay. Uh, three, three of the girls and three of the boys. She was raised in the Methodist faith, but she later became Episcopalian when she eventually arrived here in Hamilton. She attended a female seminary school for secondary education. And I don't know if you know very much about uh, female seminary schools in the early 1800s, but they had two themes. One of them was God. Everything they were taught that, that God, God was responsible for literally everything, every breath, everything on the earth, all of the earth's bounty. So God was number one. And number two was a woman belonged in the home. Uh, women did not work. They were responsible for having babies and for raising those babies and taking care of their husband as, as good as they possibly could. So it's interesting to me that she was, she went to school in an environment that did not promote females at all. And yet she stepped out of that box and became a very, very successful uh, a woman physician. In 1855, she graduated from the first women's medical school of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and this was in Philadelphia. She was among the first female doctors in the country. I'm gonna show you her thesis in just a sec. Let me just move forward here. Oh, that's not gonna work, I forgot. Okay, this is a picture of her and um, uh, in seminary school. And I'll go one more here. Okay, and this is a picture of the first women's medical college uh, building. Uh, she graduated in 19, or excuse me, 1855. I don't know if anyone knows who the first woman physician in the country was. That was Elizabeth Blackwell, and she graduated in 1849. So this is a mere six years after the very first female physician. Elizabeth Blackwell went to medical school in Geneva, New York, which is very close to Mecklenburg. And so I don't know this, but I have an idea that she took some of her inspiration um, from, uh, from Dr. Blackwell as, as well as her brothers and sisters that were following the medical profession. 
in the book that this particular quote came from, it, it really sums things up. So I'm just gonna read, the world's first regular medical college for women held its commencement in Philadelphia in 1851. Women who tried to break into this manly profession were warned that they would exhibit symptoms of monstrous brains and puny bodies, weak digestion, flowing thought, and constipated bowels. So this this is the climate well, go ahead. that she graduated in. They didn't really try to discourage them. No, they, they didn't. And you really have to try to put yourself back better than taking care of 10 kids. Yeah, into the 1850s right. yeah. and understand the um, uh, the way that, that people thought at that time. Remember, women's vote only came in 1921. Uh, so it's many years before women were even allowed to vote, okay? This is an ex excerpt from her thesis for college. And I am gonna read this because I, I want you to see the thought that goes into this and her ability to put words together and, the, and her intelligence, basically. The physician, uh, it, the excerpt is uh, on the role of the physician. And it says the physician in his true character as nature's minister and interpreter holds the sublimest vocation on earth. As sage, it is his province to explore the profound secrets of the universe and to develop the ultimate laws of things. He may follow the outline of the ways of God. The healing art is but a part of his field of ambition. Counsel must be given to those destitute of wisdom. Fullness of, of knowledge he must possess and he must speak by inspiration as though he utters the voice of destiny. For everywhere, this is the most important <coughs> sentence, for everywhere in creation is the breath of the creator and wherever that breath breathes is life. So I think you can understand that her, uh, uh, her relationship with God was really mm -hmm. ultimate. She, um, she was very, very close or uh, in, entwined in his teachings. It's a picture of Dr. Nivison and some just uh, general thoughts about her. She was described as stout and mannish. She walked quickly and purposefully. She had a place to go and she was gonna go there. Position in life was important to her when choosing friends. Um, it was said that if she got to know you and you knew her, that she was very friendly and very amiable. But in general, she was not one that went to parties or mingled with the masses. She didn't go into town very often. She wasn't that outgoing. Um, she was not sparing of her hired help. She was kind of hard on them. She never married but she took on seven children as her wards. And there's different thoughts really, if it really was five children, seven children, but in any case, some, uh, uh, some references say seven. Unofficially, she adopted one son, Sam Holliday, and he remained with her until her death in 1906, and he was named in her will. This last point is kind of important she unofficially adopted him. She never completed the paperwork. And we're gonna see this as a problem with Dr. Nivison, is that she didn't like rules. She was gonna do her own thing, and if she wanted to do it and she felt that this was God's will, that's what she did. After graduation from medical school in Philadelphia, she traveled around uh, teaching. Her faith in God served her very well and she received praise and accolades from all the places she visited. Besides rural communities, her travels took her to New York City, to Philadelphia, and she had the opportunity to meet and make powerful relationships, especially with the relig religious figures of the day. 
And we're going to see in a, in a moment the accolades that she received from very powerful religious men at this time, bishops and cardinals and uh, uh, many, many different uh, clergymen. In 1857, after two years of traveling, she settled down as a staff physician in a water cure sanitarium in Clifton Springs. And let me, yeah. So here's a picture of, of central New York. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with this area. It's a beautiful portion of New York State. Uh, the map on the left just shows kind of an overall picture and it really doesn't even have the rest of the lakes, but that's the Finger Lakes area. Um, Samantha was born in Becklenburg, which is right down here. And of course she went to medical school in Philadelphia. And then when she came back to New York State, she did her teaching all in this area here. Here are the Finger Lakes, okay. Um, Geneva sits at the top here of Seneca Lake, and this is where the medical, Geneva Medical College for Women is. Uh, these other dots, her, her first, um, the first sanitarium that she worked at, and I'm gonna talk about that next, is Clifton Springs. So again, that's right at the top of Seneca Lake. Mecklenburg is where she was born. At the base of Cayuga Lake is Ithaca, and that's gonna play a major, major um, uh, part of the story here. Um, and this is the first sanitarium called Dryden Springs that she actually started. So we'll talk about that also. But you can see that this whole area is where she spent most of her life. And this is kind of important to me because this is where I grew up too. I lived on Skinny Atlas Lake right there for a while and then in Syracuse. So um, mm -hmm. sort of a connection that I have with her. I know the area. All right, I said when after she was done traveling around, she went to Clifton Springs, which is at the head of, of the lake, um, and she began this thing called a water cure treatment. So what the heck is a water cure treatment? This form of treatment was actually started by a farmer in Vienna. It gained popularity internationally and was used to treat a whole host of different disease states. In 1842, the first water cure facility in the U.S. was established in Utica, New York. Utica, New York is also central New York. So this whole area between the medical school, the sanitariums that were there during the middle 1800s here, this is a very progressive part of, of the medical story and the building of uh, a women's careers in, in medicine. The water cure method is this. Basically, it's the use of soaking or wrapping the body with warm water. The temperature combined with the pressure of the water relieves anxiety and stress and helps the body feel weightless. Cooler water reduces inflammation of swollen tissue and you can combine it by actually drinking it. Well, what's so different about this when when you've had a hard day at work, what do you do? Women like to come home and bathe in the tub. They like jets. They like to have a glass of wine. They like to relax in water. People love to go to, uh, go to the pool, uh, the YMCA, because Hello. the water is relaxing. Hello. So even this was called a water cure treatment. Hello. This is nothing new to us. We just understand it. Um, and as far as putting things in water, um, <clears throat> how many of you, again, <clears throat> women probably have ever taken a bath with Epsom salts? Mm -hmm. Very common thing to, to, to help swollen tissue and, and to make you feel better. So this water cure treatment was new in the 1850s, but it obviously is not new today. What about a birth method? A birth method, yes, bathing, yeah. exactly, bathing <clears throat> or actually being in water when, when you birth your baby, exactly. So this is the treatment that, that she proposed at this sanitarium. Um, very holistic in, it, in its approach that 
um, that health was, that you received health or you could remain healthy by using the bounties of the earth, the sunshine, the water, the soil to grow your vegetables, etc. She was not a person who depended on pharmaceuticals. There weren't any, okay? There, there just, there weren't antibiotics. There weren't a lot of, of things that were actually manufactured by, uh, by companies. While she was at Clifton Springs, she actually became sick with some type of a lung condition. Looking back at it, people think it was probably a mild case of tuberculosis, not sure. But in any case, she left the sanitarium and went back to her home in Mecklenburg. She set up a private practice in Mecklenburg for a couple of years. She would go out in her buggy and visit patients. Um, patients would come to her home, to her office. Um, and she believed that by being out in the fresh air and taking all those trips to visit patients, that the country air and the sunshine helped her feel better. And again, I don't know if you know very much about tuberculosis, but at the time, uh, that was the treatment for tuberculosis, to be in sunshine, to be in a relaxing environment that was <clears throat> not stressful. Uh, there, there was no drug you could take for tuberculosis like there is now. So in any case, she did get better. And as she got better, she started thinking more and more about what she could do to help patients. She grew a little bored of taking her buggy all around the countryside. So she began to dream of setting up her own sanitarium and to provide her own water treatment uh, methods and to treat her patient as a whole being. In other words, not just a visit where she would go and see somebody and then leave, but have some place where people could come and actually um, spend, their, spend their life, spend their days, everything being in a more uh, uh, environmentally improved can, uh, situation or, or place to live, better food, lots of rest, um, lots of water baths, etc., etc. So that was her dream. In 1862, a property in Dryden Springs, and I showed you where that was, also in central New York, um, became available. And she decided to purchase that property. It actually was a very large hotel at the time, and people were already staying there. She purchased it and she mortgaged it um, because she had no money. She didn't make very much money as a country doctor. What country doctor did, they were paid by chickens and eggs and that type of thing, not by money. So she did not have money, but she went and she mortgaged and bought this very large hotel. Tur turns out, question, or no? Turns out that money was never a concern for Dr. Nivison. Um, she bought things when she felt that she needed them um, and she didn't know how to handle money very well. And I think about this, I think about how intelligent this woman was. Uh, she was becoming very renowned as a doctor itself. And someone that, that, that is that smart, how could she not understand something to do financially? And I, I finally came to the conclusion one, uh, was that she felt that God would take care of it all. God would provide. And that whatever was necessary, God would help her out. So it didn't matter how much it cost or how much she had to mortgage. So her dream comes true and she establishes a sanitarium in Dryden Springs, New York. It was a huge success. Over the next couple of years, people thronged to this sanitarium and not just people who were really sick, but a lot of wealthy people would come. It was their vacation. They would come and they would spend, spend the summer. Um, she provided fine dining, so they ate well, they bathed, they rest, um, and they really supported her. She also took care of patients that were not very well. Um, she took care of uh, invalids, patients who were alcoholics, mental patients. So it wasn't as though she just catered to the rich. She basically said, 
everyone is welcome, anyone is welcome. Her uh, sanitarium continued to grow. Um, there were the mineral springs that were in the area contained sulfur um, and they were very soothing uh, to patients bathing in these sulfur waters. Kind of similar to what our lake out here was sort of known for as being a fresh spring and a, a lake that would provide uh, many healthy benefits. So in general, her whole, her dream to, to treat the whole patient had come true and she was becoming extremely well known internationally. Here's just an example of the regimen that, that she requested that patients would uh, go through. Um, a daily schedule was controlled by bells. Bells would ring, sort of like in high school. Got up at six o'clock, you went for a walk at 6.30, you had breakfast at 7.30, then you went to worship, gymnastics, you had dinner at one o'clock in the afternoon, so a nice early dinner, some tea, and in between were your bathing hours, basically, as well as your consultations with Dr. Nivison. So she saw every patient every day, one-on-one -on -one consultations from 10 until noon and three until five, baths were available. And I liked this requirement. During these hours, no patients are expected to be absent from the house unless previously excused. Each patient is required to take absolute rest alone for an hour after a bath. Okay, so you can understand why this was such a relaxing environment uh, for, for patients. It was expensive. The price, by the way, 10 to $25 a week, uh, depending upon uh, how many baths you took. And lights and fuel were extra. Remember, <laughs> we're 1860s. No, no electricity um, uh, for the most part. For the, when did we get electricity? Karen Eden? I can't remember. Um, but lights and fuel, extra. Wasn't that pretty expensive for the time? Yes, yes. And therein lies the problem, is that, yes, she got lots of money, especially from these rich patients that came, but she didn't pay her bills, and she didn't pay her mortgage. She used her money to do what? To buy more land. She wanted to expand. She bought more <coughs> land in Dryden Springs, um, as well as other places, as we're going to find out in, in just a second. But when it came to bills, eh, somebody else will pay them. God will provide. Um, so not only did money pour in, but accolades arrived from religious figures all over, all denominations, bishops, judges, politicians, and other doctors. Her two sisters, one of them a doctor, Dr. Anna Nivison, and another sister, Mary Nivison, joined a brother of hers, and they helped out at the clinic, along with a very good friend of hers, Dr. Adeline Eldred Prentice. And we're going to find out that Dr. Prentice and her husband, who was a professor, um, lived in Hamilton, New Jersey. So just an example of the testimonial, and I'm, I'm just going to read this because it's, it's kind of fun. <clears throat> this particular person writes, this delightful retreat is in the charming lake country of Western New York. Healthier air, pure water, pleasanter, however you say that, surroundings cannot be conceived. For those who seek rest, what an abstinia. For invalids who would be cured, what a genial Bethesda. The reader exclaims, humbug, he is mistaken. We know we have visited these springs and our loved ones have found health and happiness at their life-giving fountains. <laughs> quite, a, quite a statement. So Samantha's insistence on purchasing more land meant that she was unable to pay the bills, as we just mentioned, and she continued to mortgage her property. Unfortunately, her actions to get 
set of presidents, and this problem is going to continue on and play into her, her situation later in life. Dryden Springs became so popular that there weren't enough rooms, that people had to stay in the village and then just come to the springs for their treatment. So Samantha is always thinking, and she's always thinking down the line and further ahead. And so she decides that she is going to expand her sanatorium out of Dryden Springs altogether and open up a new sanitarium. And oh, by the way, if I'm going to open up a sanitarium, I'm going to build a medical school along with it. She wanted to build another female medical school. Um, I forgot to mention, I think I skipped by it. One of her um, patients was a very famous gentleman who turns out to try to help her. And his name is Ezra Cornell. Um, Ezra Cornell is the one of the founders of Cornell University, and he absolutely adored Samantha. He was a frequent visitor at the spa. Um, Ezra Cornell uh, came from Ithaca, New York, and Ithaca for, for Ezra was um, the best place in the entire world. He wanted to make Ithaca um, the, the star city of the East Coast. And so in his idea of building a university, um, anything that could help his university expand and offer new ideas and new thoughts was very open to him. He thought that most places were just colleges. They specialized in certain areas of expertise, but he wanted to go in above and beyond a college. He wanted to build a university, something where you could go and learn whatever it is you wanted to learn. So if you wanted to learn medicine, then you needed a medical college along with this university. So uh, in, in any case, uh, Ezra becomes a big supporter of Samantha. Ezra says, okay, I will, I will give you some money to start this sanitarium in Ithaca. Um, and I'm going to allow you to decide where it is you want to put this sanitarium. Again, remember that Samantha is, um, she's always planning, she's always thinking ahead. And she knew exactly where she wanted to put this sanitarium um, and, and how big the sanitarium was gonna be, how many floors it was going to be, the actual architectural plans of this institute. Um, and she presented all of that to, it, to Ezra, along with um, sort of a projection of how much money this was going to make. Unfortunately, she over projected things just a little bit too much. But when it came to the building of this facility, it was Samantha who controlled it right from the very beginning. Um, she named this uh, new sanitarium Cascadilla Place. And Cascadilla Place actually broke ground about 1864. So remember that she's still, um, she's still at Dryden Springs and running Dryden Springs. At this point, it's very, very successful. But at the same time, she's engineering the development of this new sanitarium in Ithaca. I won't go so much into Ezra Cornell, but he was basically a, a mil basically he was a millionaire, politician, and a philanthropist. Um, his good friend Samuel uh, Morse and he uh, laid the first intercontinental underground telegraph. Just a, a little accomplishment, you know. Um, and then he went on to develop the glass insulators that are on telegraph on uh, telegraph poles. And that allowed um, the use of the telegraph um, where you didn't have to lay a line underground. It could be done above ground. Um, from that point, he started this little company called Western Union. Um, so <laughs> when he sold his stocks in Western Union, Ezra Cornell was worth millions and millions of dollars. He went ahead and he started to develop Cornell University. Um, as I said, there was groundbreaking for this facility that was going to be a sanitarium as well as a medical school. 
but a couple of hitches came along. Right from the get-go, they ran into trouble with the foundation of Cascadilla. It, the, um, there was a lot of ground rock and it took a much longer time to excavate the ground than they anticipated. And there was one little uh, other problem. This is 1864. Anybody know what was going on in 1864 in this Civil country? War. The Civil War. So materials were at a minimum, men were at a minimum, um, and the combination of that plus the difficulty excavating uh, set the sanitarium way back. Um, and unfortunately, this just continued. More and more money was poured into it by Ezra and the stockholders in the trust um, and uh, progress was, was very slow. The stockholders were not being paid by their constituents um, and they started to really raise a ruckus about this. Um, they, they approached Ezra several times and basically said, Ezra, you want to build this university. We understand that you want to support Samantha Nivison, but the most important first building is your library. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the uh, uh, county library in Tompkins County. Uh, that's the first library that Ezra built. It's a beaut, it's their museum now. It's an incredible uh, uh, building, but this was very important to Ezra to get his library underway. And ultimately what happened is that Ezra decided that, that he could no longer support her. He was a bit of a weenie, I'll say, in that he did not tell her that he could no longer support her. Um, and he wanted to, he really believed in her. He, he thought she was a wonderful physician, but um, his stockholders were, were just not with the program. And Ezra waited until the very, very last minute to tell Dr. Nivison that her dream of Cascadilla was not going to happen. So that particular project fails. Um, here's the building today. Uh, this is the building that, that Samantha designed. It had four floors and since then they've added a fifth. And again, it was built exactly to her specifications. Um, this particular building is now a dormitory. Um, it is named after her. Um, so if you, if you visit Cornell University and mention the name Samantha Nivison, People know who you're talking about. All right, let's move on. And I'm going to grab a little drink of water here and talk about Hamilton and how did Dr. Niverson ever get to Hamilton? Well, in 1867, so she is well entrenched in Dryden Springs. Dryden Springs is a big success. But she purchases 83 acres of property from a Dr. Willard. At that time, it was called Willard's Hill. And I'll show you a picture of this property in just a second. <coughs> but, but why did she purchase this land at this point? Well, again, think back in time. Just a couple of years before, Landis and Burns were in Hamilton. And those of you who know some history know that Landis and Burns were two Philadelphians who bought a lot of land all around this lake, right where we are now, and wanted to develop it. Um, and they, they sent out advertisements that <clears throat> were countrywide. <throat> and we have an example of one of the advertisements <clears throat> really that, that they sent out, but it promised a, a town with a, a wonderful climate, fresh, salty, breezes off of the ocean, good <laughs> soil, um, the, you know, the best possible life, mineral springs. So the same kind of thing that attracted her to Dryden Springs mm -hmm. was also available here in Hamilton. And we don't mm -hmm. know if that's what it was that attracted her or if it was something else. But in any case, she was very interested in this large property of land that happened to sit at the highest point between the Atlantic Ocean and Philadelphia. And being the highest point in that stretch of land meant again that there was lots of fresh, pure air in, in this area and very uh, 
very important for uh, health. So she purchases the land from Dr. Willard, and I'll have to give you a little hint here. Someday I'm gonna do a presentation on Dr. Willard. Uh, he was not a medical doctor. Um, he was a spiritualist. And spiritualism in Hamilton in the 1860s was very popular. Um, and some of the stories of, of uh, this area during that, that time period, uh, it's worth its own lecture in many ways. Yeah. She paid $9,000 for 83 acres. That's a heck of a lot of money, especially when she wasn't paying her bills up in uh, Dryden Springs. But in any case, uh, she, she bought that property. And by the late 1870s, Dr. Nivison decided that Dryden Springs should be closed during the winter months. That was one of the problems, is that central New York in the wintertime is cold. <laughs> and uh, to heat, to heat the, the area to the little cabins that they had and whatnot was uh, was very expensive. So she decided that during the summer she would have the sanitarium here in Hamilton and um, uh, excuse me, during the winter she would have it here in Hamilton and then in the summer she would go back up to Dryden Springs. Okay, so where is this property? Well, you guys know Hamilton even better than I do. This is a very early map. This map is actually in the uh, uh, ARH building down in town. It comes from 1872. And what we're looking at here is um, Third Street, North Third Street. Mm -hmm. And this is Francis Avenue. And you can see right here, this whole section of land, this name says Miss Nivison. And you see what looks like a building that is sort of a cross. That is where the sanitarium is. Um, here's another picture of it. And again, here is, it was called Mill Road at that time. Um, but Third Avenue comes here. Francis Street goes off to the left. And um, there's sort of like a triangle. The, the road forms a little triangle, if you know. Huh, excuse me? That's where I live. That's where you live. Okay, yep. Um, so that little triangle, if you go down, all the way down Francis Street, the railroad tracks are right here, and the sanitarium sits right here. So this was actually a stop on the railroad. It was called Nivison's Crossing. Um, so uh, when the sanitarium was in existence, patients could come and get right off at that at Nivison's Crossing and basically walk up the hill, and they're at the sanitarium. Okay. I have more pictures of this coming up too. Um, here's some railroad pictures, and again, these, these are early uh, maps, but you can see it identified, here's sanitarium, here's the two railroads that were running at the time in the sanitarium, and again, sanitarium station, that was the other name of it, so the railroad would stop right at sanitarium station or Nivison's Crossing before it would come into Hamilton. So by 1907, the late 70s, um, Samantha's financial situation was becoming quite dire. Um, again, she bought, she paid $9,000 for the property here in Hamilton and she mortgaged everything. She didn't have the money to pay for that. Um, her very, very good friend who I mentioned before, Adeline uh, Prentice, Eldred Prentice, lived next door. And she uh, kind of saved Samantha at one point and bought all of her property for a dollar. And it was really just to save the property so that Samantha could use it at a later point. However, once Cascadilla kind of uh, fell apart and that dream vanished, she decided to refocus her energy somewhere else. And I think that she, she thought back to earlier years when she was in school um, and another sec section of, not section, that's not the right word, uh, another portion of our population that was very underserved at the time were infants, um, newborn infants. Um, having a baby in the, in the middle 1800s was a very dangerous thing. Um, infant mortality was, was dramatically high. Um, actually, if you had a child and that child became sick, 
and they were under the age of around two or so, the baby either lived or died and you had quite a few children. So if you lost one, oh well. Um, so hospitals for children hardly existed at all. And those that did exist still had incredibly high uh, mortality rates. In 1876, Samantha visited Philadelphia for the exposition that was being held there. And I, I think she probably met up with some friends who convinced her that her next, uh, her next role in life or her, her next dream she should try to realize, and that is to build another sanitarium here in Hamilton and devote it to the care of children. And as I said, the state of, of infant care in the United States was very, very bad, especially in cities like New York City and Philadelphia. Uh, children under two just left to die. Overall mortality for the high and low, meaning the rich and the poor in New York City for children under five was over 60%. So if you had a child during this time, there was a 60% chance that your child might not make it. That's pretty astounding. Mm -hmm. What was Dr. Nivison's uh, thoughts about this? What kind of treatment was she going to provide these okay. infants? Really the same. Go ahead. I, I know. What is uh, the, the time foundling? What's the definition of a foundling? A foundling is, is an um, infant that... Um, uh, is ill, um, cannot, does not have parents, so no one to take care of it. Um, an orphan child, an orphan child is, is what I think of. Is that a born to an unwed mother, for mm -hmm. Many probably were, right. but I think even um, those that were born into a family with the mother and father, if the, the child was, was ill, they just discarded <coughs> the child. You know, it, it's funny, I, I like to watch these series on TV about um, uh, New York City in the late 1800s and you see everyone dressed up in their fine gowns and, and they're walking the streets and they live in these brownstones and um, that's one side of New York City in the late 1800s. The other side were all the shanties and the shacks mm -hmm. um, and that was the, the terrible, terrible side. So those children were very, uh, uh, very susceptible to uh, not surviving. So Samantha decided, um, or again, believed <laughs> that what these children really needed was just a clean, safe environment to be brought up in. They, they needed fresh air, they needed rest, they, they needed sunlight. A lot of the shanties in New York City didn't even have windows. So. Um, there was no light for these children. So in any case, uh, her thoughts on, on helping these children was just to provide them with a clean, safe environment. Um, during this time, of course, many clergymen around the area remember Dr. Nivison from her work in, in central New York, which is still going on by, or was at this time still going on. Um, and a, a clergyman here in Hamilton uh, by the name of Lewis K. Lewis uh, really took up her cause and he wrote this prospectus about the Nivison home and the purpose of this was to try to raise money for Samantha uh, to, uh, to help support the, the building of the sanitarium here in, in Hamilton. The name of the sanitarium, it actually had quite a few names. Nivison Home was one. It was also known as Summit Grove Place. It was known at first before it became an infant sanitarium. It was actually known as Hamilton Sanitarium for a short time. So patients were, were being seen. They were adult invalid patients and they were being um, mostly cared for by her friend, Dr. Prentice, who, who lived uh, right next door to her. So in any case, Dr. Reverend Lewis <clears throat> took up her cause and tried to promote the Nivison home to the best of his ability. And he had an ulterior motive. Um, he, he provided a lot of statistics about the couple of sanitariums that were available in New York City. 
One of the largest was a Catholic home. And it was his idea that if children were, if infants were brought up in a Catholic home or in a Catholic hospital, they would become Catholic, which kind of makes sense. He was uh, not Catholic and he felt that if children were brought up in a non-Catholic sanitarium, that they would follow that religion. So he said it was time for uh, Protestants to kind of step up and to provide some money to, uh, to help this, this home. Um, so an ulterior motive altogether. And just, I'm not gonna read through these, but just look at, at the, all of her supporters. Again, she was uh, very, very well known and famous as for her, uh, uh, for being a physician and for her treatment methods. Um, we had judges, uh, all types of clergymen, uh, the governor of um, New York State, this is the son of Ezra. Um, and it, the list just go, and that's a partial list, to be honest with you. Many, many more. In his prospectus, Lewis stressed that the mortality for New York City foundlings under a year old was anywhere from 86 to 97 percent. Um, so Dr. Nittison knew that this was where she needed to start this home and that uh, it, it was uh, a very important endeavor for her. So she bought the land back from her good friend uh, and then resold the land as part of a trust to these three men, Barnes, White, and Blair. These were three New York City businessmen. And he, after he bought the land back from her friend, she resold it. Well, she put it in trust. She didn't really sell it. She put it in trust to these three gentlemen. The deed of trust clearly outlined the details of the property, including the buildings of the land and the goal of Dr. Niverson, which was to set up a completely charitable healing home for any child uh, and, and for parents or guardians had to completely turn over the care of the child to Dr. Niverson. The infants would be provided with clean, fresh air, nutritious diet, and loving caretakers. So, Mothers who brought their children to the sanitarium literally had to sign over their children. They didn't get them back. They couldn't come back for them. And Dr. Nivison said that she would keep the children through their, through their teenage years until they were ready to, be, uh, uh, to, develop, to go out on, on their own. So this was a, um, not a situation where you could just go and leave your child for a couple of weeks until I got better and then go back for him. <clears throat> the cottage opens. The deed for this trust also outlined plans to build a separate building and it was called the cottage. Um, Dr. Nivison's visions were very far ahead of her time. Um, her ultimate goal along with her supporters were to expand Summit Grove and make it self-sustainable. This was 83 acres of land, and she envisioned this as becoming farmland that would, uh, they would grow their own food, they would have their own livestock, so it was gonna be completely self-sustainable. <clears throat> In January of 1884, the sanitarium opened. And so here's where the, the sad part of this whole story begins. January of 1884, the sanitarium opens. Infants arrive from all over New York and Pennsylvania area. Many were near death. They were severely malnourished. Some had diphtheria. Some were a little bit healthier because they were the, the, the children of, a, of illegitimate uh, mothers from New York City and, and Philadelphia. So you're, you're right, Kay. No one was refused. And again, it was if a woman did not want her child for whatever reason, she lived in Philadelphia or New York, she could get on the train, come down and get dropped off right at the sanitarium and walk the baby up to the hill and here. Contributions came in the form of cribs, furniture, and funds for a nurse, even Mrs. Astor, we know the Astor name, she donated uh, a 
the funds for a nurse for a year. But other than that, people unfortunately did not send what she needed most, money. She got furniture, she got help, but she didn't get money. And Samantha, Samantha was totally, totally broke. Uh, and she remortgaged again. She just mortgaged and mortgaged and mortgaged, mortgaged. Uh, with the thought, I believe that God will prevail and God will help. In February, reporters from the South Jersey Republican visited the cottage and reported that the babies were in good health. They were well fed. They were happy. Everything was copacetic. Everything was good. But between February and May, a tragedy happened. By early May, 27 infants had been accepted into the sanitarium, so there's now 27 babies there. However, there was a measles outbreak. Um, and the measles outbreak uh, took the life of 11 infants in a rather rapid succession about the middle of May. Dr. Nivison felt that very likely all of the children had contracted the disease. However, uh, measles is a type of disease where it can be very mild, it can be very severe. The incubation period is 10, 15 days. So um, after the first group of infants passed, these first 11 infants, there was a lull for several days where infants seemed to be doing okay. And because she was so desperately out of money, um, she decided that she needed to leave the sanitarium and go to New York City to try to get money to sustain the sanitarium. So um, she left the sanitarium. Um, according to the South Jersey Republican, oh, uh, I'm sorry, um, when these babies were died, as these babies died, um, she told the, uh, her adopted son, I believe, to take the babies and bury them in the back of the property. She chose a piece of the property that Dr. Willard, the gentleman that she had bought the land from, had already buried a previous relative of his. The ground supposedly was consecrated, so in a religious uh, uh, idea, this was consecrated ground. Um, so she asked her adopted son to buried the babies back there. As I said, when there was kind of a lull in the death of the infants, she decided to head to New York City to try to raise funds. While she was gone, unfortunately, the worst happened. Eight more babies died after she left Hamilton. A couple died and then several days later, a couple more died. And so once again, she instructed her adopted son to uh, <clears throat> to bury the babies in the back of the property. We don't know exactly where. Uh, we have an idea, but in any case. Um, by her arrival home, 21 of the 27 children had passed away. Knowledge of the deaths brisk briskly traveled into town. On Monday, June 2nd, Ezra Hunt, another Ezra, from the State Board of Health visited the home where Samantha, while Samantha was still away. The doctor examined the home and the infants. He found wooden boxes for coffins, but no death certificates or permits to bury the children. And so this is what becomes a big problem for Samantha. Uh, a couple of days later, so Tuesday on the 3rd and the 4th, reporters and a group of uh, summoned jurors knock on Samantha's door. She has no forewarning of the inquest that was about to happen, nor did she have any defense attorney. So in other words, the state examiner had heard, this Ezra Hunt from the state board, heard about these infant deaths, and he gathered together a group of men from Hamilton and went to her home and basically put her on trial in her home with no attorney, no nothing. The inquiry was held in Samantha's home. The coroner, oh, let me read a little bit of this because this is kind of hard to read and, and this is important. 
<clears throat> Last Monday, Dr. Hunt of the State Board of Health came to Hamilton to investigate a report which had reached him. 21 of the 23, and at that time they said 23, but it was really 27, infants received at the Nivison home had died. Justice Hill, acting coroner, <clears throat> uh, by the way, the, this judge, Justice Hill, was a justice of the peace. The coroner was out of town, so uh, a justice of the peace took over for him. I find that, uh, I'm not sure that he was very well versed in, in being the judge, but nevertheless, uh, he kind of took over. Um, the other people that were gathered were very important people in town here, and you, you've probably heard these names. P.S. Tilton, he had the Tilton General Store here in town. George Elvins, the other general store. Um, um, Isaac Smith, uh, Mr. Seely, uh, Seely's a very famous name around here. Albert Weatherby, Harry Trowbridge, the Trowbridge building downtown. These were considered to be uh, men of uh, good faith and, and they, uh, they were going to be her jurors. So um, when they came, let me read a little further here. Oh, County Physician Ingersoll was present with Mr. Endicott as the county attorney. Uh, four little bodies were taken up and examined. They were found buried in ordinary boxes, but the little forms were neatly prepared and the boxes were prettily lined and padded. <clears throat> While the flowers deposited within these improvised caskets indicated that sympathizing hearts were present when the, uh, when the short lives ended. There's no indication that any desirable testimony was intentionally uh, suppressed. The verdict of the town was as follows. So this is what appeared in the South Jersey um, Republican. The verdict was that Samantha Nivison was guilty of burying uh, babies basically on her property without a permit. She was not found guilty of being, uh, uh, of murdering the children as some of the um, upcoming article, articles are gonna tell you. Um, she was not found guilty of, um, of many of the terrible things that, that uh, will befall, befall her shortly, but she was found guilty that she did not have the permits. Well, think about this again for a second. Think about Dr. Nivison. This is a woman who does what she wants to do. She didn't adopt her son. She never followed through with the adoption papers. What is a certificate of death and why does she need to have a piece of paper when she wants to bury children? How many people, we're in the 1880s here, how many people buried their relatives on their property or had children that they buried? Did they all have certificates of, of death and, and burial certificates? I doubt that very many of them had it at all. During a portion of this time when, uh, when these babies were dying, Dr. Nivison wasn't even there. So when the, um, when the examiner came to the house and he asked for the permits, um, she wasn't there to sign any permits. The babies were dying while she was away. So even if she had wanted to have permits, which I don't think she did, uh, or that, that she uh, cared about, um, they were available. In any case, she was fined $100. Um, and uh, you would think that might be the end of the story, but of course it's not the end of the story. Whoops, I have to go back. Since reporters were allowed in her courtroom, being her home, the reporters took what she said and twisted it in every possible way that you can imagine. And all across the country, headlines appeared. Uh, babies hurried to their graves. Fatal atmosphere at the Nivison Home for Infants. Um, an institution opened last January buries all but two of its 23 inmates in the backyard. They didn't spell the town right. They didn't spell her name right. So obviously this, uh, I'm not sure how qualified this paper or article is, but nevertheless, um, St. Louis Dispatch, wholesale in, infanticide. Even Mays Landing, 
The excitement of the people for miles around still prevails over the fi finding of 21 dead babies in a Nivison home near Hamilton. Criticisms of a harsh nature are freely expressed. It is charged that at least three fourths of the dead infants were from illegitimate offspring of wealthy Philadelphia and New York people in good society. Miss Nivison has not yet been arrested. However, Prosecutor Thompson of Atlantic County will take charge of the case and in all probability order the arrest of Miss Nivison. This publicity, you can imagine what it did. It took a woman who had built this incredible career as a physician and as a promoter of healthy lifestyle um, and uh, healthy living and it, it just um, destroyed her basically. Some of the accounts uh, accused Dr. Nivison of actually murdering the children, of being what was called a baby farmer in those days. And they said that she murdered the children using belladonna and aconite. Uh, and Miss Nivison did admit that there were times when she used these flowers <laughs> to, uh, to help soothe the children. But to go as far as to say that she murdered with the these uh, babies with this is a, a, a bit much. A little bit about belladonna, you may know of it as nightshade. It is very poisonous. However, if it's used in very small quantities, and she actually stated how much she used, um, it helps soothe babies, it helps sedate them. Remember these babies that came to her were very, very ill. They were near death. Um, some had diphtheria, many had very, um, um, digestive systems were really not in good shape because they were starved. Um, and so they were in a lot of pain. So trying to help these infants by sedating them a little bit would not be something that I would think any of us um, would consider to be a, a, a bad thing. But obviously, if you use too much, um, yes, could, could the babies die from that? Yes, they could. Another one that she used was aconite. And aconite can also be poisonous. But guess what? You can find aconite in ShopRite today if you walk down the aisle. Um, Aconite is, is another medicine that's a homeopathic type of medicine that's, that's used um, for allergy types of, of relief, itching, watery eyes, that type of thing. So uh, the New York Times asserted that Miss Nevison testified that she made use of aconite, belladonna, and morphine principally. I don't believe that she used these medicines principally. I believe that my own belief is that she probably did use them to help these children sleep better, uh, but that, that's it. It was, she swore her theory that infants could be raised on milk and tea combined with such medicines. The <clears throat> Ithaca Daily Journal, uh, Journal later refute, refuted the accusations they previously had made. Here's the diet that Dr. Nivison really did feed the children. She used arrowroot, this is arrowroot, and arrowroot is a substitute for wheat um, it's a thickening agent and it's used for intestinal disorders. She used Irish moss, which is high in potassium, uh, can be used to reduce phlegm. She used imperial granum, and this is just a label from, if this was bought in any kind of a general store at all. Again, it's, it's wheat and milk gruel. And she used something called Dr. Meig's formula. Dr. Meig came from Philadelphia and he published the first chemical analysis of human milk and cow's milk and what percentage was protein, what percentage was uh, carbohydrate, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, Dr. Meig's formula is still the mainstay of formulas today. So uh, Dr. Nivison was, was very forward in, in using his formula. And again, just shows that she was kind of way ahead of her time in so many of her thoughts and her methods. Um, but at that time, uh, they didn't know, the reporters didn't know who Dr. Mead was and, uh, and they uh, published so many bad things about her. 
tragedy destroys her career. By July, all major newspapers had recanted their story. However, it was too late to save Dr. Nivison's career. She continued to care for children who had not passed, but very few new infants or children arrived. The sanitarium at Dryden Springs also continued, but the condition of the property deteriorated and patient numbers declined. Samantha sold off more of her property in an attempt to keep both residences open. She also attempted to start a company in uh, selling the, the bottled water from Dryden Springs. However, this now is close to 1900 and medicine has moved forward and the idea of water cure methods and bottled miner mineral water was not as popular as it was uh, when she was using the methods in the 1860s and 70s and 80s. So <clears throat> bottling this water did, did not help. Um, doc, Dr. Nivison died suddenly, supposedly from an asthma attack in 1906. Um, she had no other previous history of asthma, so I'm not sure why they felt she died of an asthma attack, but she was buried in Becklenburg, back up in New York State. Her adopted son, Sam Holliday, eventually inherited the land. Unfortunately, because he was never officially adopted, when he, uh, after she passed away, the land was not given to him uh, immediately. He left the state and moved out west, and it wasn't until several years later that he actually um, uh, did, um, did gain the land. However, he never came back, um, and unfortunately, the land just kind of deteriorated. Sam Holliday moved out of state and his property was abandoned. Um, so he never came back to make the claim of his property. And South Jersey Republican uh, states that the property was put up for a public auction in 1912. During that time, the buildings had been raised. Um, so we don't have any pictures of the Nivison Sanitarium at all or the cottage. In 1912, the property uh, was bought at this public auction by Antonio DeMarco, Mr. DeMarco. Um, the, the mansion itself was really in terrible repair. And because of the reputation of the sanitarium and a place where so many children uh, had died, he chose not to rebuild on the same spot. He actually built his home using a lot of the wood and whatnot from the original Manson um, on Francis Street, right next door to um, where the mansion was. Later, his son Michael uh, built a home on the site of the sanitarium. And I'm gonna show you again here some, some pictures. <clears throat> So all of her original land was this whole section right in here. Um, here's Third Street, here's Francis Street, the railroad, okay? And Rainier Avenue um, is up here. She owned all of this. The mansion, the sanitarium was right here on this corner. And here's a picture of the hill. <laughs> um, this is the home that Michael DeMarco uh, built. So this was the site of the original sanitarium. Um, this is a picture of the walkway that came up from the railroad. The railroad is right here. So patients could get off the railroad right at Nivison's Crossing and literally walk up this, this walkway. So the walkway was clearly visible here and the mansion would have been right where that home is now. Couple more pictures. Um, again, just the walkway that comes up. Um, this is the, all pictures of that walkway. This is a ge geographical or a geodetic survey. This appears on the DeMarco land now, identifying it as the highest point of land between the Atlantic Ocean and Philadelphia. <clears throat> this is Bridget DeMarco's backyard. Um, we walked all through here and it, uh, I'm really short on time, so I'm not gonna get into a little detail, but there's an interesting place right here. The, the mansion we feel is probably um, built right here. 
and we think that the infant cottage, we know that it was behind the mansion. There's a nice clearing back here that Bridget called the baseball field where she uh, and her siblings played ball when she was a, a child. I don't know if that perhaps was a clearing for the cottage or, uh, or not, I, but uh, it's an interesting thought. Um, and again, we don't know exactly where these infants are, are buried. Um, they are behind the property here at some point um, since these children were newborns and are now, what, 140 years old in the ground. There, there's nothing left to try to find any kind of remnants of bone or anything like that, even if somebody wanted to. There's just nothing, uh, nothing there. So it remains a mystery of exactly where, um, where this cemetery was. This is just the uh, stone for Samantha's grave. A gentleman that wrote The Healer, and that is the book that is online, very interesting book, uh, just wrote uh, or took this quote, some roads lead to the future are slowly being opened, but the way is long and the farther we travel, the longer looms the untraveled way. So it's a sad story. It's a, it's a fascinating story in how, what a wonderful physician she was, how, how forward she was in her thinking, um, way ahead of her time um, as far as her, her thoughts about medicine and health. But um, she had, she had some faults like we all have and those faults got her into some pretty deep trouble and as a result her reputation uh, has been totally just destroyed so but i think that might be all yep that is all any questions oh i do have one thing to show you <laughs> i've been doing some digging up on the land not to look for infant bones but since we know where the um, we know where the mansion was, Bridget, who is the lady who owned the land, and I had been doing some digging, um, and the only thing that we could find, but it's very interesting, is this doorknob from the yeah. mansion itself, um, and it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful marble doorknob. Um, so I, I wish we had more, but if you'd like to kind of take a look at it. If, if anybody at any point knows where we might find a, a photograph, um, that would be uh, very, very valuable. We also have a very large section of the sidewalk that came up from the, from the, I, I the pathway. Brought, yeah, the pathway. Yeah, I brought a big thing of concrete back. And that's in the museum also. So that's, uh, um, you want to talk about the, the plaque real, uh, just briefly? Just a little bit. Um, well, the Historical Society, um, Greg and I being um, members and, uh, and I'm the curator right now for the, for the, his, for the museum, um, we purchased a plaque for Bridget. She has a, a concrete angel and we purchased a plaque that, that just was dedicated to Samantha Nivison. Um, and her, her willingness or her wanting to do God's work. And, and again, that's, a, that's something that I would like you to, to take away when you think about, well, did she over sedate these babies? Was she in any way responsible for, this baby, for these babies' death? Remember her, um, her, her background and her uh, love of God and that God would provide. Um, and I, I just personally cannot believe that, that she uh, showed any malice whatsoever towards oh, these no. infants. No. Um, and it was simply um, uh, an outbreak of a childhood disease that can, can devastate uh, uh, a population of infants, and, and it did. And it was too bad that it took so long for the people around her to, to understand that and to uh, recant their, their very um, negative attitude towards her. In any case, we presented this plaque to dedicate it uh, to Dr. Samantha Nivison, and I think Bridget was going to take it and with the angel put it down by the walkway so that um, 
at, at least it identified the it's site. It's quite the overgrown. Entries. You can't see anything from Francis. Well, she has cut down several of the trees oh, yeah. now. Um, we don't believe that the infants, unfortunately, are actually buried on her land. We, we think that the infants were probably buried further back, and that land is now owned by someone else. Teresi? Um, I'm sorry? Mr. Teresi? Um, no, no, oh. it's not. It's um, Hilltop Estates. It's an LLC. Several of the people that live on um, Rainier Avenue. Um, this goes into another whole story, but yeah, in any yeah. case, they <laughs> they have not permitted us to go onto the land. That's so yeah. it would be nice if there was a nice just. Uh, well, again, we we cannot find where they are buried. So if that was consecrated land, is there any? Uh, uh, paperwork to say that it is to prevent development from occurring there? I don't know the answer to that. This Dr. Lewis, uh, he was a Presbyterian um, minister at the time in town, uh, and she was an Episcopalian, um, but that's going kind of far back in those church records, and um, you know the story of churches here in town. They were moved and one church became another church and it became another church and um, so I, I don't know but I, I don't think it would be easy to follow as far as church records uh, are involved. I did go to, to May's Landing and I looked up all the deeds of sale of the land and how she bought and sold land. She, she bought and sold that land probably four or five times back and forth and back and forth because she it was mortgaged so much she had to do something. Um, and I would think that somewhere in court records, if they went back far enough, you'd be able to find the fine that, that she was levied, the $100, but um, I don't know where to find that. Mm. Good job. Mm. Good job. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you too. <laughs> you know, so much of this is uh, 